Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person, Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. This is our 25th year. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. During our conversation, please send us your questions and let us know where you are joining from in the live chat. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Ruth Ellenberg Eisenberg share her firsthand account of survival with us. Ruth, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person. I know this is your very first time speaking as part of our first person program. We are grateful to you for your willingness to share publicly some of what you went through during the Holocaust. So welcome, Ruth. My name is Ruth Ellenberg Eisenberg. I come from a town in Western Galicia. It used to be Poland, it used to be Austria, now it's Ukraine and it's Kalat. I am one out of six siblings, the youngest, and I had a beautiful, beautiful home before all this happened. And, and Ruth, if you, if you will permit me, I'd like to um, uh, get us started by first acknowledging before we get started that yesterday, um, excuse me, two days ago on the 15th, um, on Monday, you celebrated your 89th birthday. So please accept from us our belated birthday wishes to you for your birthday this year. Congratulations. Thank you so very much. So Ruth, you, you, you were born April 15th, 1935, as you said, in Skalat, Poland, which today is in Ukraine. Before you tell us about the horrific events that you and your family experienced during the Holocaust and World War II, please do tell us about your family, uh, your parents, Hirsch and Fega, the rest of your family, and, and those early years before the war began. I come out of a, we were six siblings. I am one, I am the youngest, and I had beautiful parents, Hirsch and Fega, and they were, just such kind, warm, wonderful parents. And my father owned a tannery and my oldest brother Yitzchak joined and worked with him. My sister Malka, she went to Vienna to learn a trade, to be a corset maker. In those years, he used to make the brass and corsets to order. And then my other sisters, I believe, you know, they were, you know, younger, of course, after they finished school, usually, I believe, they had seven grades, which was at 14. So if you were not able to afford to go to, you know, study to become, to have any profession, you were homemakers. Every girl knew how to crochet, how to knit, how to embroider, and they were great help at home because in those days you didn't have anybody to clean, anybody to help. So the siblings used to help. And I was very spoiled because, you know, the youngest, whoever had a little something good, used to pass it on to me. And my most memorable time is that my father used to come home late from work. And if I was awake, he would take me on his lap and sit with me and have his dinner. And that memory will never fade away. That warmth and love will last throughout my life. It was one of my most wonderful moments that I remember this as the most important. My mother was a sick woman. She had heart problems when I was born. 
but she did everything she had to do. She was a very, very good, good human being. If people in town needed to marry off a child and they could not afford, she gave first whatever we could afford for charity, and she would go around trying to collect to make sure that that couple can have a halfway decent wedding. She was the most wonderful, gracious, good human being, both my parents and my siblings. I really cherish my memories, whatever I have. I had just such a wonderful, warm, loving family. And they, now I have a broken heart because only one sister, Ronya, and my brother Yitzchak had survived with me. And right now, I'm the last one of the family, of the two families, the Sess family and my Siegel family. So life is very, very difficult for me. The pain it never goes away, but I'm trying to go on with life and volunteer at this museum to try to enlighten people that we cannot allow this to ever, ever exist again. Ruth, and you, as you, and, and every week you go to the museum to volunteer. So thank you for that. You you mentioned that you were, of course, the youngest of si uh, with six siblings, and so you've mentioned your sister Malka, your brother Yitzhak, um, and your sister Bronia. You also had uh, a brother Sh uh, Shamo and a sister Miriam, um, and Miriam uh, had some. Had, she had hearing difficulties, didn't she? Yes. Yeah. She had some problems. And then a couple more questions uh, before we move to, to the awfulness of, of the Holocaust, um, Ruth. Was your family religiously observant? Yes, my family was very observant. They were just, you know, doing the right things. They were not, you know, like doing something very outrageous. They just observed the Sabbath and, of course, observed our Bible and they were very righteous people. They did a lot of good. My father and my uncle, they were together in business. They had two sisters which needed help. They were pretty poor. So for Shabbat, they made sure that the sisters get the food. They were helping with whatever they could. So I think it's something that I can be very proud of. My parents were very gracious. And they were, you know, doing charity and just did, in my opinion, very, very wonderful things. And Ruth, as you, Ruth, as you said, you had a uh, just a loving, uh, caring, wonderful family. Uh, and we have a photograph of your home. It, it, can you just tell us a little bit about this? Yes, this is my home, which looked much different. This fence is still there, but we had a beautiful white. It was all, of course, like new looking. And I cannot tell exactly the front because this little thing, the attachment is, was a sukkah. We kept this year round. And then when Sukkot came, we were able to make a sukkah out of it. So the entrance might be around the corner. But I remember a beautiful white fence around it and steps, there were about four or five steps in front. And when I stood on those steps, I could see we had a market which would bring like once a year during springtime, they would bring a down like a carnival with like a merry-go-round and all different kinds of here. Of course, we have much more, you know, bigger carnivals than that. But it was very exciting for me as a kid. That's my most pleasant memory that I used to be able to attend and go for a merry-go-round ride and just walk around and have a fun day. And I used to remember seeing it from those steps. Mm -hmm. So this memory is, you know, one of my most pleasant as a child because mm -hmm. I did not have too many after that. That's sort of finished my my fun and, so, and we're gonna yeah. we're gonna we're gonna turn to that that time now Ruth if that's okay with you World War II began in September 1939 Nazi Germany invaded Poland from the west and the Soviet Union invaded from the east 
your hometown, Skalat, came under Soviet occupation. You were just four years old at that time. What, what can you tell us about what it was like for you and your family living under the Soviets? I remember very little at that age. The only thing what I presume that life was still fairly decent because we did not get invaded until 1941. So my memory is feeling that maybe I had those a year or so, but still, you know, being able to maybe play and, and do little things. But my memories are very vague of that time. Mm -hmm. Ruth, you, you had close neighbors, the Sass family, whom we will hear a lot more about um, as we go on. But what do you recall about them as a family from those early days? As far as I am concerned, their siblings were quite older than I was. But my siblings, like Yitzchak and Malka, and I believe Shama, they had connections. Some of them went to school together, and they knew each other for a long, long time. And we became very connected during the war. They were very, very instrumental in helping us survive. Mm -hmm. So that family is really something that, you know, I treasure and they really helped us survive. Yeah. And you're going to tell us a lot more about them for sure. Ruth, before we go on, I'd like you to know that we have people watching and listening to you today from all over. I'd like to welcome our viewers who are watching from around the United States from Arizona today, Kentucky, Nebraska, Colorado, and Massachusetts. But we also have international viewers today. Uh, we have people watching you from Malta, France, Argentina, and Canada. Uh, so a lot of places. I'd also like to share two comments that have come in from the audience. Charisse writes, total respect. It cannot be easy to talk about this experience, but she does it because we all need to know. And Carolyn writes, sending love to you and thanks for your willingness uh, to, to, to do this today. Life, Ruth, changed, of course, dramatically in June 1941 when Nazi Germany launched their attack on the Soviet Union. By July, the Nazis had occupied your town of Skalat. Please tell us what happened once the Nazis took control. Once the Nazis invaded, Right away at the beginning, things just became horror. The you know, killing started right away from the beginning. It was just really like we maybe expected, but not to the point where they just came in and started right away. Because right away they had this pogrom and like 1,500 people were taken up to this fortress all the way to the top. And the the fortress forced, that we're looking at right now, right? right? This is the fortress that they forced. They, they, what I hear about 1,500 people and that they threw them down to their deaths from that, from that height. Mm. So right away, that was right as soon as they invaded. This was the first the pogrom. And right after that, there was no day of, you know, of peace. Every day was torture. Every day, we all thought this was the end of us. And can you imagine such how such an atrocity? How can people do something like that mm -hmm. to push people to go down, to, to jump from there to death? I think that this is something outrageous. And I'm just hoping that this museum and by us, whoever from us, the volunteers are survivors that we won't be here for long, that people do understand how horrible it can be when people get into large groups. Small groups could have never accomplished this. So my wish is always when I speak here to try to, you know, beg people and ask them to please try to stay away from gangs or from any animosities because this is no end yet to it. And I feel in my, at my age, what I went through hearing all this anti-Semitism still going on, 
yeah. is a very, very bad vibes. Ruth, I tell, was, us, tell us a little bit more about that when, when the Nazis first took over. Uh, what ha tell us what happened to your father's business. They confiscated my father's business, but they kept my oldest brother Yitzhak to sort of be their mentors. So he was able to be a little bit more, you know, free for a while, you know, just that they, you know, had him, like, as I said, mm -hmm. their mentor. So he did teach them the business and it was a little bit easier for him. But it didn't last that long, you know. You, they, they, I wanted to ask you, Ruth, um, uh, you were six at this time. Were you Were you able to start school? No, I wasn't because school didn't start at seven. So I was not able to start school. And, and then, of course, um, things just got even far worse uh, soon after that. And in October 1942, the Nazis carried out an axion or operation in Skalat with terrible consequences for you and your family and your community. Tell us what happened. Well, we sort of surmised that horrible things are going to happen. So we built a bunker and it was in a wet cellar, of course, with, you know, it wasn't really to be used for anything, but we were able to, that when the sirens started, you know, we were able to get into that bunker. It was most of my family and it was the Sess family that we hid together and there were also a few other families they tried to bring families from nearby towns into us to Skalat so it would be easier for them to catch everybody and you know send them to the death camps so at this in this bunker at that first horrible action they we were hiding in that bunker and my oldest sister, Malka, had a little baby girl, and this baby started crying, and the parents could not control it. So, of course, we heard that they're sort of trying to, you know, work around the bunker there. So the Cess boys and my brother, we had a wall on the other side of the cellar, which was made out of bricks, and they surmised all their power, whatever they could, and they were able to, to knock that wall out. So the people that were to the left, the Nazis fought right away, which included my two sisters, Malka and Miriam, the baby, and my father. On the right side was my mother, my sister, Bronya, and myself, and some of the Sass people. And we were able to jump out of on the right side and just run wherever our eyes carried us. And my mother saw this empty barn that usually horses were there, but it was empty at that point, and jumped into a barrel where they keep the, the uh, horse food. She jumped in and grabbed me in there and covered us up with a burlap. And we stayed there for a full long day, which felt eternal. And of course, you know, it's unimaginable staying in, in that and hardly breathing because the, uh, you know, the Gestapo was walking around all over. But luckily, they did not think in this empty barn that we were so lucky that we were able to stay through the day there and listen until it got very quiet. And then we got out of there and we still, you know, went back to to my home, but it was, you know, every minute, every second of the day to feel that that might be the last. So I guess it's unimaginable to live under such circumstances. And, so, and Ruth, before we go on, um, tragically on that day that you've just described to us, on that day, your father, your sister Malka and her baby, as well as your sister Miriam, they were not able to get away from the SS. Please tell us what you can about what happened to them. We believe babies probably was killed right away. My father tried to step on the side. They did have like two lines for people 
that they thought could go to labor camps and do some heavy work. So my father tried to get into that line. And my two sisters, Malcolm and Miriam, a baby, as I said, must have been killed right away. And my two sisters were taken away. We believe that the camp closest to us, the death camp, was Belgium, but we're still not sure because none of us were there to see or to know to this day. But my father was taken to this camp, which was right here. It was called Camp Janowska in the Wolf. It was a city, you know, about, I would say, you know, maybe a couple hundred miles from us. And they had this big labor camp. But at the gate, when they were taking in the people, they decided that my father and a few others were not strong enough to do this labor. So my father, we were told some people had been there and seen it, that my father was shot right in front of this gate, gate where you get into this camp. And there is a nice memorial right next to it, which, you know, has all the names of the people that, you know, that were killed, that they knew were killed there. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to tell us more about that memorial as we get towards the end of the program, Ruth. So the picture we're looking at, of course, is a photograph of the Janowska uh, camp where your father died. Um, one of the things that I know that you shared with me, Ruth, is, and it's so painful for you, and that is that you have no photographs of, the, of those family members at all. Um, will you say just a little bit about that? Yes, that's correct. All I have is of my brother, my oldest brother, Yitzhak. I think we found one in one of the pockets somewhere, tiny, and I enlarged it. And I have a picture of my uncle, David. He was in business with my father. I do have a picture of him and the family. And I have a picture of my grandma, my mother's mother, and an aunt. So I, I feel that my mother seems to me what I remember looked a bit like them. And my uncle, I believe my father looked a bit like, like his brother. So it is pretty horrible not to even have a picture of those dear ones that perished. But yeah. unfortunately, that's what it is. Yeah. Ruth, um, after that axion that you've described to us that you lost your two sisters, uh, uh, your, your, uh, Miriam, um, and uh, uh, Malka and her baby and your father. After that, your family was forced to live in a ghetto in Skalat. What, what do you remember about your life for that time in the ghetto? Well, it was horrible. I mean, you know, we knew that this ghetto is not going to last, you know, and that meant that they might just take us all and, uh, and you know, right away and exterminate exterminate us like everybody else. But luckily they did have a camp in my town. Almost every town had a labor camp. So the camp in my town, my sister was able to go. My sister, Bronya, was a teenager. So she went to this camp and she smuggled me in at night. That I do not remember at all how I got in there, you know, it, it, this is a little mystery to me, but she did smuggle me into this camp and she put me, she had a cot like an army cot, so she put me on that cot and covered me up to, and, and luckily I was very tiny at that time and like you could hardly see anybody that's there. She covered me up and I had to, I stayed there for a full day under covers and just hardly breathing because they kept going around checking the cabins that everything is just orderly. So that day, of course, was eternal for me. But I do remember that. I yeah. will never forget that day. And, and Ruth, before before you continue from there, I'd like to just interrupt for a moment. And um, I'd like to remind everybody in our audience uh, that we'd love to have them um, post on the chat feature, their questions for you. We hope they have questions. And before we go on, I'd like to share another comment from an audience member, Ruth, this uh, Cooper, and Cooper is homeschooled. He's age nine and is reading the diary of Anne Frank. And, and we came across this uh, today. Cooper says, thank you for speaking to us today. 
we appreciate you. So that's that's coming live right now to you by by Cooper Ruth. Ruth, um, what you're describing to us now, um, uh, when you left the ghetto, that was uh, in June 9th, 1943, when the Nazis and their collaborators emptied and destroyed the Skalat ghetto, deporting or murdering most of the remaining Jews that were living there. So you described to us that you were taken and hidden uh, with um, your sister in, 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 in the, the labor camp. Tell us what happened also, uh, how your mother and your brother um, got out of the ghetto and how they survived and where you went from there. Well, my father was shot at that camp, Yanovska. Right. Uh, my mother, you know, we were together for until she just could not really, she gave up on life, losing her two daughters, now grandchild and her husband. She really gave up on life. And, and, and Ruth, before you go there, um, I want you to you tell us, because I know you'll want to tell us about, um, after after you went with your um, your sister, you then were taken um, by a friend of the Sasses, Marco Baranovsky. And, and tell us where you went with the Baranovskys. Well, at the end of that day at camp, yep. at night, this man, this wonderful, righteous man, Marco Baranovsky, came. At first, he had come, I think, the day before. So he took the Mrs. Sass, he took Mrs. Sass, he took my mother, and they took, I think, one other sister. Uh, uh, I, her name was Heike Sass. I think those three people he took. And then, next day, he came back at night for me. They smuggled me out of the camp. He came with a horse and buggy, and he took me to the same place to stay with these other, like with my mother and with my with the Sass mother and with the two Sass one Sass girl. And I, you know, they were just wonderful, righteous people. They hid us like they had two bunkers. They had one uh, up on the attic in the barn and one like in the house, a small little space. So I was there with the other people, but then when the camp liquidated, he went and he brought the other rest of the family, whoever was alive, which was the Sass, was a lady in the Hama, and it was Motel, and it was my brother Yitzchak. Altogether, I think we were hiding there about between 10 and 12 people. Well, and it was a little home that you were hiding in, right? Right, right. Very, very righteous people that I will never, never forget their name. But but sadly, you had to leave that home. Well, tell us why that was. Neighbors came in one night and saw that she was cooking this tremendous pot of soup. So they right away surmised that she's hiding Jews. And they came in and they said, you better get rid of those Jews right now. So they came in to us and were the saddest crying to tell us that we got to get out of there. So they took us, they had nearby growing potatoes, which at that time it was summertime, that they grew very thick. And we got into ditches there and the potatoes. And we stayed there for a full day. And at night, we had heard that some Jews are hiding in nearby forests. So the boys went at night and walked, I think, might have been between three and four miles to the nearest forest. And they did see that there are Jews hiding there. So they came back. And that same night, we started, we walked. But my poor mother, she could not walk anymore. She was just too weak and too worn out. So we had to leave my mother there in the ditches. I will never forget such a horrible thing, what we had to do. It was my brother Yitzchak, my sister Bronya. It was the Sassis, whoever was left from them, that we started walking to the forest. And I, nobody had helped strength to carry me. So I believe I was seven at that time. And I walked with them to the forest 
and they dug this big hole. And, and before you tell us that, Ruth, just one more um, uh, comment about um, when your mother could not go on. Um, the the Marcos Marcos family, uh, Marco and his family, they they went back to the potato field, and I, I believe you told me that they they buried your mom. Yes, that's what we yeah we had some sort of connection that other neighbors got letters to us. Yes, he did bury her there, and it was just the most horrible thing to do. But it was a question of either all of us stay in those stitches and you know die from hunger or whatever else, or we leave, which was quite a tough decision, you know. And and once you you once you left. Um, and lost your mother in the potato field, you found refuge hiding in the forest where the Sass brothers and Yitzhak had gone to check out. And you were hidden in the, you were hiding in the forest for nearly three months. That is so very hard for most of us to even imagine. So please tell us what you can about what life was like for you living out in the forest. Well, we that of course, the man dug this big hole. It was just horrible to be there, you know, just living in real nature, which is good to be there a day or two. But we were there in this, in that hole, covered ourselves with branches and just, you know, had to just had to do whatever we, we could do to survive. At night, the man would go out and try to scavenge for some food whatever they could grab from nearby gardens, any kind of a vegetable. And they, when they got back during the night, we had to wait till the next day, till a sunny day to put up a campfire, like with a, you know, with a pole. And we had an old pail and got some water in a stream nearby and just put those few vegetables, whatever they had, and just had to, to live with this, you know, nice watery soup. But then also due to the Sass family, especially in this case, it was Paul Sass that had nearby very, very dear friends, you know, and they, they were instrumental in giving us some bread and sometimes some pierogi. So when they came back with that, we really had, that was a, very, very special occasion for us to get some bread and have a couple of pierogies. So through the Sass family, we really grateful whoever from us had survived, which it was my brother and myself, it was due to the Sass family, you know? We Ruth, were... um, and, and, and there's so much more about the Sasses we'll see later, but um, I, we have a photograph now of three partisans or resistance fighters standing in a Polish forest. As you look at this photo, can you describe this environment and how it compares to what you experienced in, in the Polish forest you were in? This forest is not the one I was in, but it just shows the thickness of this because I haven't seen forests like this anywhere. This, we never could have hidden. This was so thick that you really could not see through there. But I guess we used to go through very, very <laughs> carefully and the men were able to dug this hole. I guess they had to clear some of the stuff. Yeah, I was too young to remember details. I remember the hole. I remember being in there. But it was really a tough, of course, everything in my life was very tough. But this was, the forest was something that we really could not have made it if not for help through the sasses that we had some food because, you know, it's, it's hard to survive without food. Ruth, so I, I want our audience to, um, to really uh, understand um, uh, that, that you were in that forest, uh, all of you were in there and you were in a hole, living in a hole, not like uh, a, a bunker or shelter. You were literally in a hole that you all had dug out, covered with some branches. You were in there for three months. It's just so hard to imagine that. 
Uh, thank goodness that the, there were some people outside who did provide a little food to the sasses, as you described. But you were there three months, but you left. Why, why did you leave the forest? Because in Europe, the snow started around October. And at the end of October, when the snow started, that created a problem that we would leave footsteps and that would create problems because the Ukrainians used to come into the forest. We had one or so come and visiting and sort of on the friendly part, they, you know, didn't bring food or anything, but they just came visiting. They knew Jews are there. So again, from the Sasses, they knew a lot of people around there. So once in a while we had visitor, but we could not have survived being there in the winter time. Yeah, that's that's a really important point. You said that you you your concern was leaving footprints, snow in the snow, but uh, even beyond that, just the sheer brutality of winter and cold, you had to leave there. So in December 1943, you then found a hiding place with a Christian Ukrainian family, the Shevchuks. Who found that hiding place for you? And what do you remember about the Shevchuk family? So again, says boys, and my brother Yitzchak was there. They went to this guy, Shevchuk, and Motl again, Motl says the oldest of the Sasses knew him very well. And I'm not too sure if they still had a little money or anything to give him. And they said, you see, there's four of us strong young guys. One hopefully will survive and we will take revenge if you hurt any of these women. Because this Shevchuk happened to be a Bandera, a, a Ukrainian police guy that at night, I believe he himself went out killing people. So it was quite a, a, quite a story because... P.S. He did keep us there till the end of the war. It was horrible conditions, very, very little food. We had to get some water, you know, they left water for the horses. We were in a barn, you know, with, with a hay, the, behind a hay wall. And at night we could see through that he was changing his uniforms and he used to go out, you know, and we figured any, any, Night is going to be our night, but this was a miracle. This guy seemed to have taken those guys serious, and he just kept us there till the end of the war. And it and was, Ruth, uh, this a uh, little bit more about uh, this, Mr. Shevchuk, um, as you said, you referred to him as a Bandera. Uh, he which was um, a nationalist um, Ukrainian organization that that was known for. Um, killing uh, both Poles and Jews. So as you described it to me, in a way, it was a perfect hiding place. There you were, Jews hidden with a uh, a person who was very violent towards Jews and 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 others. So that was um, kind of a uh, an incredibly uh, risky and scary place to be. But as you said, um, he responded to what was said to him by the Sass boys and your brother and kept you until until the war was over for you, which for you was March 1944. Um, as the Soviet army pushed the Germans west, your group was liberated by Soviet forces. That was March 1944. The war would continue, however, in Europe until May 1945, more than a year later. What, what can you tell us about that time between when you were liberated in March 1944, the end of the war, and April of 1945, how did you, during that time, how did you manage to make ends meet? How did you manage to find food, shelter? What did you do during that time as best you remember? At that point, when we came back to Skalat, we had a, another brother, Shama, that was, you know, that was in the Russian army and uh, he was not with us together. This is a picture of the three of us. And he found out that he has two sisters alive. So we started corresponding. There was the forwards paper that's still existing. It was in Yiddish and in English and a few languages. So 
a lot of people, that's how we connected with relatives. So my sister, Bruanya, had a job right after we came back to Skalat. She was a teller in a bank. And after a month or two, we, she decided that she was going to go and visit my brother to Russia. And I stayed again with the Sasses in my house. My house was the only house kind of that you could really still live in. Mm -hmm. So I stayed with the Sasses and my sister went and my brother Shama was working at Kharkov in a hospital at that time. And he said that he's got to go home with his sister, with Bronya, because I am very weak and undernourished and I might be dying any day that he's got to come and still see me. So luckily they gave him, you know, time off and he came back to Skalat and we only stayed a very short time because my brother was actually, I think he, he might have still been under army. I'm not too sure whether at that point, but anyway, he was very, very frightened. People after he came back to Skalat, my sister said, we got to get out of there. So we started, you know, we started. Ruth if, I, Ruth, if I could just jump in here for a moment before you move on to this next really important part, um, just so our audience understands, uh, Shomo, your brother, when you were under the Soviet occupation, he went into the Soviet army, and that's why he wasn't there for all the events that you described. And then your sister Bronia was able to locate him. But before he came back, I believe, or right about that time, you experienced another tragedy, and that was your brother Yitzhak, who had been with you through everything you've described. He was killed. Will you, will you tell us about that? And that explains why in that photograph we just saw, it was Shamo, your brother, your sister Bronia, and you, and that, those were the only family members remaining when that photo was taken. What, what happened to Yitzhak? Well, the man after... The Shevchuk took us in, the women, there was three women, and my sister Bronya and I, the men stayed down in the forest, and they were just, you know, running from place to place, but shooting and planes were still around. And my brother Yitz, my brother Yitzchak, and one of the Seth brothers, Jacob, got killed from a bomb. And that was the most horrible, on top of all my tragedies, it was just horrible that we got home and we were hoping that he's going to meet us home. And P.S., you know, the other says boys came back and the three says boys came back and said, unfortunately, these two guys are no more. So it was just so horrible for us to have this tragedy on top of everything else because he acted like our father. He took such care of Bronya and myself. And then luckily that we were able to find my brother Shama, that he was also, he was quite a bit older than me, a bit older than Bronya. When he came back, he started taking care of us. Yeah. We decided that we got to get out of Skalat because it was no life for us. Everything was just very emotional, horrible. It was the memories. We just could not really stay there. So we left our home and we left everything. But my sister, my brother Shama and Bronya myself left a little bit before the Sasses, maybe a month before or so because of my brother. He just thought that the, the Russians are looking for him and that he was very uncomfortable. So we just kept going. And the first stop we made was in the Lvov, which the Sasses again had family. And we went there and we stayed with them. I believe we even had a Passover with them, with that family in the Lvov. We stayed there for, you know, a little bit. And then we just kept going. We just kept moving on and on because we just did not want to stay in Poland or Russia, whatever was the occupation. We just wanted to get out of there. It was everything was soaking with blood, with Jewish blood, and it was impossible, you know, to just be able to make yourself stay in these places. So we just kept going and going. We kept crossing borders. 
border upon border. That's the part that I don't remember exactly the consecutive how, but I know we passed through. First, we went to Poland, like we went to Krakow. There was a family from Skalad that survived, and they had an apartment in Krakow, and they were able to take us in for a little bit so that we were able to you know, get a little bit to relax between place and place. And then from then, from there, we went, oh, 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 we went on, like we stopped by in Austria and Hungary. We went through many, many different borders, very, very hard walking mm -hmm. on the rocky roads and everything. And so Ruth, and just, just to, to complete that picture, it's you and Shamo and Bronia, probably as you were saying, walking, covering all that all that land, crossing through various borders after you left Poland. Before we go on uh, from there, I wanna uh, bring up another question from an audience member, if I could. Uh, and I, many in our audience are wondering the same thing that Teresa is asking. So Teresa asks, Ruth, what got you through every day until you found freedom? What got me through? Yeah, what got you through? How did you keep going as a child through all of that? I was just very lucky to have my sister and brother, somebody to care for me. And I just, I guess, survival. I wanted to live, you know. I just had that urge to live and go on with life. It, I think most of us that survived just just wanted to keep going because, you know, once you made it, you just wanted to try to get somewhere where you could have more or less a fairly normal life. So that, you know, survival is something that's hard to describe. It makes you strong. It makes you, you know, just... The will to live is a very, very strong matter. I think that's what made me also my family. As I said, my sister, Bronya, my brother, Shama, having someone to take care of me, it, it, it made me strong and it made thank, me want to go on. Thank you. For, thank you for sharing that with us, Ruth. Um, in, in, in mid to late 1945, uh, the three of you made it to a displaced person camp in Cremona, Italy, where you stayed until September 1947. Please tell us about, you know, what you can about some of your time um, at the Cremona displaced persons camp, because you were there for um, uh, all, the better part of two years. Well, this is was really a relief because it was like the first stop that we sort of had a little place where to stay. It was not very, you know, comfortable. It was an army camp, but it was, as I say, the idea of not being scared every single day. This was a trip we took. They, one thing in the camps, they did give us daily trips, tours to go to you know, local different sites and see. And this one especially, they took us to a camp in nearby. It was like an orphanage. They took us like for a vacation. And I am, you know, this I, is nobody else from my family is here. Just a very few good friends all the way on the top and the end of the, most of them were older than I. I. I was probably among the youngest in the camp. I mean, there were younger children, but among the teenagers, I mean, I was only like 12, gone, gone 13. So I was the youngest. But after a while, they did give us a separate room for the young girls, like teenage girls, and a separate room for the guys, which that was much better. Because in the beginning, I stayed with my sister and brother in one little, like, you know, uh, uh, like an uh, emergency room, this little hole there. That's where we stayed, you know. And then when they separated us into different rooms, it was much more comfortable. We had more showers available to us. We got, like, once a month, they gave us a few bars of chocolate to the kids. It was a little bit more comfortable, you know. So that part of the, in Italy, was already like 
starting to live my life, you know. And we were studying only Hebrew because there were a few survivors that had studied Hebrew before the war and they knew enough to be able to teach us because most of us were ready to go to Israel. That was the only place home that we thought we can go to. But through this paper forwards, this Jewish paper that my brother... I'm going to jump in for just a moment, Ruth, before you go on, um, because we have another photograph before you move on. I want you to tell us about... But before you tell us about this photograph, did when you, do you remember if when you were at the Cremona Displaced Persons Camp, did you feel that you were safe from danger by that point? Yes, of course. I yeah. felt safe. That was the first place that, you know, we really opened our eyes and said, yes, we're alive. I guess that's, we are going to be, we're going to be living, you know. Mm -hmm. But this picture, when we were together, my sister and brother, my on the quota, Polish quota, which was very slow and trying to bring people as I, oh, again, I'm sorry, we have to go back that my, I had an uncle here, my mother's brother, Charlie was his name, Charlie Siegel, which came in the early 20s. To, to the United again, States, right? Yes. Yeah. And again, through this paper forwards, he found us and he started corresponding with us and he said, that he wants to help us to come to America. So my brother decided that we should do that. And I was taken off from the, my sister and brother from the quota. They took me off because of my age and they right away sent me to go and get the, to Genoa, Italy. And they gave me a visa right away. So this little vacation was already with my these are my hands to come to America. This was like 10 days before I left. They took us to this wonderful place in the mountains called Salvino. And I believe we stayed like in an orphanage home. I think they made room for us and some went home like to different places for the summer. So we stayed there like for 10 days. Right after I returned from this place, I had... I had to get myself ready to come to America. And it was a bittersweet because my sister and brother, I, I just was so used to having my family. And there all of a sudden at age 12, they, you know, I had to go to America by myself because my brother explained me that then if they get called to come and I'm off the, the list, it's gonna be a confusion. So it was a, you know, like sort of a, a good decision that I need to go. And I am so grateful that I did that because I had a couple of years. My sister came two years after me and my brother came three years after me. So I had a good head start to get started with a little bit of education. And my aunt and uncle were very good to me. I stayed with them and they treated me like their own daughter. And, you know, really, I, I couldn't have asked for more. And, of course, I was lonely for my family. And it also, I stayed in a small, I stayed in a town in Massachusetts. It was New Bedford, Massachusetts. It was a uh, Portuguese Town, a lot of people there, Portuguese people. I started school. I was age, I was age 12, and I started like in fourth grade, which made me terribly unhappy. Mm -hmm. And luckily, my aunt and uncle took me to New York. I had other relatives to introduce me, made me a little luncheon. And I had a great aunt and uncle. Their name was Bumsy. And my uncle asked them if I could move in with them because New York, Brooklyn had a lot of refugees and I really, they decided that they can take me in and my uncle paid for me because my other aunt and uncle were pretty poor. My uncle was a milkman in those days. So they paid for me to stay there. And I really opened my eyes because from grade four, they put me in right away to grade six. And I could find friends that also were European children that survived. 
So I started being a little happier, you know, it started, my life was a little bit more, you know, so it was a great thing that I came, even though, as I said, it was bittersweet. So Ruth, we, I, 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 as we get closer to uh, our time being up, you, um, even though you, the, the sadness that you felt by leaving your sister and brother behind coming for them, it turned out to be in some ways a real advantage as you described, I'm gonna jump forward several years if I can for the moment. In 1953, you married one of the Sass brothers, but you weren't the only one to marry a member of the Sass family. Say more about that. Well, we all decided to marry into the Sass family. They had two brothers. They had two brothers, so married my sister and me. And then they had one sister, which married my brother, Shama. So we were intermarried three times, but led a very happy life. We were very close with each other. We even had a business together. We socially were involved. It, it was really very, very special. I, I, I just wanted to make sure that, that we, before we finished, that you were able to share that remarkable um, bit of information. Um, I, I do have two more questions for you uh, before we close. Uh, one is not my question. It's a question uh, submitted, a video question submitted by a student named Annalise. So let's go ahead and hear from Annalise. And then I'll repeat her question for you. Hello, my name is Annalise and I'm from Washington, D.C. After the Holocaust, did you remain in contact with the families who hit you, such as the Baranovskis, who were recognized as righteous among the nations in 2019? Annalise asks, after the Holocaust, did you remain in contact with the families that hid you, such as the Baranovskis, who were recognized as righteous among the nations in 2019? Yes, we did. We went back in 1996. A lot of us went back to this little village where we were hidden. These are two ladies that are not the original, they're not the original Baranovskis. They are the children, and they were my age. Did not know that they were hiding Jews, and it was just such a wonderful thing that we were able to find them. We had like a private bus took us around, and it took us quite a while to try to find exactly because it was so many years after that we didn't quite remember, you know, but thank God the bus took us there and we did find them. We were in contact with them for quite a while. Of course, when we were there, we gave them whatever we could spare money and some of the clothes, what we had, but I we kept in contact for quite a while. It was difficult because that was already, you know, like, Ukraine, Russia, if you send packages, not everybody, everything got there the way you send it. But luckily, we had one man in Israel that was on this trip with us that used to go back every year to Skalat. It was, you know, memories, and the municipality was very, very friendly and was very happy to see him. So whenever we could, we used to send him some money with this guy to deliver because it wasn't that far from Skalat. It was probably maybe half an hour away. But unfortunately, we did lose contact now because of the war and everything else. And there, you know, I am 89, which they are the same age. I don't know if they're alive still. Because at that point when we were there, my granddaughter was with us. She was eight years old. And she says, you know, they call me, this is my granddaughter. They call me Bobby, you know, in, in Jewish and in Polish, Baba, Baba is a grandma. So this little girl of my granddaughter said, they are your age because they already looked, you know, they were, you know, the way they're dressed. She couldn't believe that they were my age. So this is the place that we went to visit when we went back to Skalat in 1996. We put up this tremendous monument. We all, you know, donated money and the Polish, of course, government, everybody helped us get this up. This monument is a memory of around between 1,500 and 2,000 people that were thrown into this grave. 
It was, you know, outside of Skalat. It was in a village. And we decided that we want to put up some kind of a memory. So this was something very special. All the churches surrounding there helped us to, you know, to, to do this, to be, you know, to memorialize all those people that perish. And it was just something that, like, you felt like the sky is opening. It was a beautiful sunny day. And we were a group of about 90 people. We went, and then the churches that came with all, it was just an event that I will always remember. We were speeches in Yiddish and Polish and Ukrainian. And then we were singing, of course, the Tikva under this open sky. It was something that maybe it was a little bit of a closure that we were able to do that. We also tried to refurbish a little bit our cemetery in Skalat because they took stones that looked something like this in front that we had over graves and they put them in the streets all over Skalat. They put them on the sidewalks. They made fences out of them. So at that point, we also put together some money and we refurbished that little cemetery that we have a corner. Instead of having a whole big field, they made a playground out of our cemetery. That sound, Ruth, that sounds like that was such an amazing experience. And, and I, I like uh, that you mentioned that it also was a form of closure in some ways. Ruth, I, I do have one more question for you today before we close, and that is, as we face a dangerous surge in anti-Semitism, please tell us why it is important to share your firsthand account of the Holocaust and what people can learn from it. Well, I don't want people to go through what I went through. My family, my community were targeted because we were Jewish. Nobody should be discriminated against simply for who they are. I tell my story so that people can see what happens when hate takes over. Education is so important to help people understand these issues and help people work toward a better world. Ruth, thank you for those closing words. And also, thank you so much for being a first person for the first time. Uh, uh, we are so grateful that you decided to do this, and we hope this is the first of many more visits with us on first person um, and, and also to continue the volunteer work that you do at the museum. So thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'd like to um, also take a moment to thank our donor. First Person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I would also like to invite you to join us again next month for another First Person program. Thanks for being with us today.